Good morning, everyone. My name is Doug Thies. Is that too loud? All right. My name is Doug Thies. I'm the founder of IT Leaders in Indianapolis and now in Louisville. Welcome. This is our second meeting. We had to make a, a change on venue late in the game, and I'm really grateful to Eric Satterley, who's right up front here from Bellarmine, to help us make a move to this location. I, I feel like um, I feel like uh, today I consider myself the luckiest man. You know, I feel like the old stadium, uh, the echoing. So, uh, this meeting is for staff IT directors and managers and VPs and CIOs are welcome as well. This is really a leadership focused meeting. We don't talk a lot about technology unless it's part of the context of the topics we're talking about. Uh, most of the people who are in this room have been promoted from amazing individual contributors to some level of incompetence as a leader, right? Peter Principal, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with that idea. It's very rare in engineering disciplines and from what I've seen over the years, it's rare any time now for individual contributors to get any sort of leadership training. Management training is common. We teach people how to fire. We rarely teach how to retain. And that's what we're here for today, is to help you work on your own leadership skills. All right, uh, you've had breakfast, you've, which means coffee in IT. Uh, there's plenty of food back there and plenty of coffee, so take advantage of that. You've already had the chance to network uh, a great deal with each other, I really appreciate that. We're gonna have two guest speakers after I talk, um, and I've actually got a few other people who are gonna come up and talk about other events that happen here in Louisville. I'm a big fan of cross-promotion. I think it's really important for you to know where you can go to meet like-minded people. Some people call networking misery loves company. I think I mentioned that to a couple of you. It's powerful to find out what other people are doing. Uh, we also, in the Indianapolis version of this meeting, have a mentorship program that's pretty self-service. If that's of interest to you, um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, please take photos, if you would. Um, if you could take photos of the different speakers. I got a few of um, all of us while we were talking, but if you could take a few photos of the speakers when they're up here, I love posting those on LinkedIn so that other people in the marketplace can figure out that this is a good event for them to see. Uh, the way you can keep up to date is itleaders.org slash Louisville for this event. There is also a LinkedIn group, oddly enough, called IT Leaders Louisville uh, that we post information to as well. And you can refer to that, you can refer to IT Leaders Louisville with an at sign in front of it, you can pick that up so it links right to the group. Uh, on the website, back to the website, you can sign up for the mailing list here. So if you'd like to keep up to date on what's going on in more of a push fashion, that's probably the best way to do that. And registration for the upcoming events happen as well. Um, as I mentioned, we do mentorship in the indie market. And uh, what that is, is about a dozen CIOs or IT leaders have volunteered to be mentors, and it's a very self-service oriented program. And if you are interested in finding a mentor or being a mentor, I wanna hear from you. I don't wanna set up a program that's not gonna be used necessarily. There's no reason to do that. But if that's of interest to you, uh, contact me. Contact me via email or get on my calendar uh, using this Calendly link and be happy to talk to you about that. By the way, I live in Indianapolis, but I'm down here at least once a month, so we can do the Zoom thing or the Teams thing, or I can meet face-to-face -face with you, whatever you prefer. So I wanna talk about some other groups. Shannon and Anna and Duran, do you mind coming up here so we can catch you on the microphone um, and make sure that your group information is included? Come on, Shannon. Um, included in the video. There is, we are video, videoing this event and we will send you the link afterwards if you want to review some of the presentations or if you'd like to share this 
with your audience. Go ahead, Shannon. Three minutes, is that right? Okay, three minutes. <laughs> Real fast, my name is Shannon Fair. I am the, um, there's a slit here in the middle, yeah. Um, can y'all hear me okay? I'm the CEO and founder of a, a company called Rocket Women. So I have three minutes. So um, really fast, I think I'm going to focus on how I can help you all and how we can work together. Is, um, <clears throat> so basically, I, um, my mission is empower women, empower women. I used to work for an IT company years ago called Voice.net. They've since been bought. Um, they're Trace 3 now. But basically, I was tired of being the only woman in the room, so I thought I'd do something about it. So in 2015, I put on my first Women in Technology conference. My goal was 40 women, and we had 103 at the very first one. So I thought, okay, there's something there, right? So uh, since then, and it's kind of a, a long story about how everything evolved, but basically I launched Rocket Women in 2020. I'm a wedding and event planner, so as you can imagine, I had a ton of time on my hands in 2020. So I spent the entire pandemic uh, working on Rocket Women. So I launched it in December of 2020, and now uh, we just had our, the fifth annual Women in Tec Technology Conference in December, and we had a little over 400, and I think it was like 470 women, and some men too. Um, our organization is absolutely, everything that we offer is on our website, rocketwomen.com. Men are allowed to everything. The first one, they weren't only because I had a point to prove that I could fill the room with women. But now they are, we have men and we have a membership, we have a mentor program, um, we have monthly webinars, uh, we have one coming up in February, and then we have lunch and learns, and uh, we have a lunch and learn in March at QSR Technologies, which is an incredible company. Um, so if you would like to attend those, check those out. But we um, also, it's just rockitwomen.com, is that my cue, my time's up? Okay, rockitwomen.com. Um, there's also a job board, and that's one of the ways we can help you if you're trying to hire women in technology. That's the number one page that is visited on my website. So if that's something that interests you, you want to hire women, I know a lot of women in technology. So thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Kepshire. I own KEP Training, and Jay Brown and I founded Derby City Agile, also called uh, DC Agile, probably about four years ago. So we are now about 1,500 members. We're the largest active meetup group in the state of Kentucky. But because we went with DC Agile, we've been able to pull people from Washington, and we've grown this really international. So I've been lucky enough to work with uh, uh, Chet Henderson, who was first to sign the Agile Manifesto. Chet has opened up his Rolodex. So we have, like Rick Mook is one of our speakers. We have the best speakers, and we just pull from really Chet and um, Damon Poole and some really big names in the Agile community. So I'm extremely picky on who gets to speak for us. So every time you hear a presentation, they have totally been screened and approved by myself, and I always enter um, channel Chet and say, would Chet approve of this? And if he gives it a thumbs up, I give it a thumbs up. And then with the help of Teresa Bevins, we've been able to do two conferences and we'll be doing an open space conference soon. And it's just a way to give back to our community and um, we love it and we'll go from there. So hope you can join our group and we're um, Derby City Agile on Meetup. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Duran Bryant. I'm with a company called Mirazon. We do IT consulting and we also do managed services uh, for, and we're the, the region's premier solutions provider. We host a group called LUMUG, which stands for the Louisville Microsoft Users Group. And uh, it's been around for a long time. Some of you have been to that event. It's once a month. It's usually the last Friday of every month. And it's basically a group that's focused on technology that impacts local professionals. And so our next event is coming up on the 24th. It's called Love Your Backups. And we're gonna be talking about immutable storage, uh, which is a fancy way of saying we, you can do backups in a way that hackers can't get to it, right? So that is gonna be Friday the 24th from 11.30 to 1 p.m. We would love to see you there. It is an in-person event. To sign up, you have to go to lumug.org, and you can sign up from there. So that's it. Thank you, guys.
Bad Scott, GuidePoint Security, a 12-year-old national cybersecurity only consulting firm, managed services reseller. Doug and I want to buy a beer at Against the Grain Brewery, April 13th. Not only the beer, but those pork bellies on a stick at Against the Grain. Are you know what I'm talking about right now with those pork bellies on a stick? Come out and join us. Grab a pork belly on a stick, have a couple beers, we'll have a good time uh, against the Grain Brewery. Good parking, downtown Louisville, everybody know where that is, uh, at the ballparks? Look forward to seeing you. Thank you for joining us. Have a good time. We allow service providers and vendors to sponsor a few happy hours a year, both in Indy and here, so Chad's breaking the ice on that in April. Uh, our next bi-monthly peer group, which is the meeting that you're attending right now, is May 9th. We are the second Tuesday quarterly, if you are looking for an underlying pattern here. It's the second Tuesday quarterly here in town, so that means February, May, August, and November is when those events are happening for, for the bi-monthly peer group here. Uh, we have one of the two speakers nailed down. We're about five minutes away from getting the other speaker, but Elias from uh, Yum Brands will be speaking. We got to chat with him briefly a week or two ago. Chris, that was amazing when we had that conversation, so I'm really looking forward to that. Let's see how I'm doing on time here. Uh, how can you help this group grow, and how can you drive more benefit for yourself and for your team members? Uh, first of all, connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is Doug Thies. Last name is spelled the is, T-H-E-I-S. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm a bit of a loud mouth on LinkedIn, but please connect with me first so we can stay in touch and you can find out what's going on with the meetings, both here and in Indy. We have some amazing speakers in Indy too, so if you've got the, if you've got the flexibility to drive a couple of hours every now and then, uh, um, we've got amazing speakers up there too. Uh, share the video and share the presentations with your colleagues. We'll follow up with the two presentations that you'll see today in PDF format so you can refer back to those. We will also send you a link to a video and those videos are published on my company Expedience YouTube channel. So you can watch those videos after the fact too and you can share those links with folks who might be interested in attending. Uh, and also schedule some time with me. I'd really like to hear some feedback. You'll hear from me um, in the upcoming weeks to just talk about what you're thinking and what you'd like to hear and maybe other people in your group that might benefit from this. So we'd really appreciate time to uh, talk about that. So how did this thing get up off, off the ground here in Louisville? Uh, Centric Consulting was huge on that. Chris, you wanna talk a little bit about Centric? I'm Chris Durham from Centric Consulting, and I'm so thrilled to be with you guys today. It was about a year ago that Doug and I were first introduced, and he had been hosting this group in Indy, and we started talking about the idea of bringing it to Louisville. And for those of you, many of you work with Centric, and you know us, so we're a 2,000-person um, international business consulting and technology consulting firm. And when leaders reach out to us and say they need help um, and that they want to engage with us, it's not because the problem is easy. Um, it's usually because they have a vision or they have a problem or they have a big thing that they want to do with their organization. And we bring the team members to execute and deliver and implement the system or the software or the change, but at the crux of it is the people. And that's what Centric brings. And that's why the work with Doug has resonated so much with us because it is all about trust, leadership, the relationships to bring an organization along to make those changes happen. So thank you so much for letting us be a part of this. We're excited. Thanks, Chris. You've done a huge amount of on-the-ground work. Dion, thank you. Danielle, thank you. All the Centric people have done a great job of getting the word out on this. So much gratitude to Centric. Also much gratitude to my company, Expedient. Um, they let me spend my time and their money putting on events like this. 
We are a full stack cloud services provider. We offer co-location and VMware based cloud and uh, DR and a number of other services out of 14 data centers in 10 cities. We are looking for a data center in Louisville. I mentioned this at the first meeting. I wanna mention it again. Uh, we are looking for a corporate owned data center that's got plenty of room to grow uh, who the company would like to monetize that data center first and would like to uh, drive monthly revenue into that data center as well. So if you know somebody or if you know a company who has a corporate owned data center that they'd like to turn into money, we would be very interested in talking to them. Uh, the company's name is Expedient.com and uh, again, the video for this meeting will be posted on Expedient's YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Expedient and you'll see a notice on that. Today's speakers, let's get to it, enough of me. Um, AJ Holly will be speaking first on honesty and Rick Mook will be speaking second on can an agile approach make work more humane. Give me a second here to get us all squared away on presentations. And Rick, come on, or I'm sorry, AJ, come on up. You're in business. You're in business. All right. Hey. Thank you. Good morning. 845 slot. Honesty is a topic, a room full of business and technology leaders talking about honesty on Valentine's Day. I do not know how I got myself into this, uh, but that's where we are. And I kind of thought Saturday, I was thinking, is it right that this topic is on Valentine's Day or, or wrong? Not sure. Um, but, um, and frankly, it made me think that uh, Doug and I actually stumbled onto this topic. We, he reached out to me a few months ago and, and, um, about this opportunity, and of course I was interested in doing it. And uh, I'm gonna be honest with you in that it took me a while to really hone in on what I wanted to talk about. And it just popped into my head uh, literally the second time we, we spoke after exchanging emails. And I thought, why did that happen? And if you think about when you're introducing yourself, and I'm gonna do that right now with backing up, you back up to a milestone. Many of us do, right? That project or that job or that opportunity. And mine, some of you have heard, some of my old friends in the room, was 2005. It was my first um, large project to lead as a change management practitioner, a change leader. And that was a two-year SAP project for a spirits and wine company you all probably know very well here. Uh, that's today is Beam Suntory. That project uh, went well over its um, budget, uh, its um, contingency at least by 25%. We did a lot of cool things and we made a, lot, a ton of mistakes and I learned a lot from that. But ever since then, I've been involved in, whether it's SAP or building new buildings, uh, moving people from one office to the next, to efficiency programs, there are those phases of the project, right? Or that initiative that you're part of. And all of that, whether it's, you know, the, I gotta talk with my hands, whether it's the waterfall, it, that linear time is there. And the waterfall kind of fits to that linear time. But we know whether you're doing agile or not, there's multiple sub teams, right? There's the project team, the sub teams, the stakeholders, the key stakeholders, and then the wide audience, and then some of the external people. And it's all pushing and pulling on us and we get stressed out, and we get challenged to what? You just tell me, what, what comes to mind? We get challenged to do what? I need your help. Anyone? You gotta speak up. Faster, better. What do we get challenged to do from a human standpoint, though? What's, what's hard in those moments? Tell the truth. <laughs> Right, what did you say? Patience? Yeah, absolutely, I have very low patience. Uh, I have a need for pace, and it's not necessarily low patience with people, but I have a need for pace. And um, when I don't feel like I'm getting the things done in that project, it's very difficult. So anyway, where I'm going with this in the honesty is not just, um, 
what do we think about when you hear the word honesty? Well, uh, well, let me back up. I want to know your first reaction when you saw or heard that this topic was going to be talked about today. So here, I need you to be very honest as well. You, authenticity? What was your reaction, though? Intrigued? Come on, I need some negatives. Somebody in this room probably had an eye roll. Regurgitate speed of trust. Can, oh, okay. I didn't know about that, and thank you. That's, you're being very honest. Anyone else? Did anyone have an eye roll like, oh, that's the soft stuff, you know? Confused. <laughs> it's good to see you again, by the way. Good. Thank you for those reactions, all right? What is the first word or phrase that comes to mind when you think of honesty in the workplace? Some of you are given some already, but it's okay to hear them again. Transparency. Gosh, went right to it. Thank you. We're going to hold that and come back to it. Integrity. I'm sorry. Rare. More honesty. Risk. Accountability. Gosh, this is good. I'm sorry. Vulnerability. I got to hold my thoughts because it's making me want to share something I'm going to share later. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, as Doug said, when we had to change venues, I would much rather be down here with you guys facilitating and we were going to, we hoped that we'd have a big board because I wanted to collect some of your ideas that we're going to go to in a minute. Um, so we're going to do this together and we'll just keep going. And I appreciate you speaking up because it'll probably help for those on the video who probably can't hear you. And I'll do my best to repeat so it may feel a little bit redundant. So let's just, I did a little bit of searching out there just to ground us, right? But the searches I made, uh, this one for example, uh, from compliance and ethics, um, I won't read it to you, you can read. But there's a couple of phrases in here that really ring true to me when I think of honesty or who's an honest employee in the workplace. And it's not just telling the truth. So you guys tell me, which, which is your favorite phrase that you see here? When it, especially when it comes to projects. Cannot tolerate lying. Fudging data, that, that was mine. Okay, really the point of this is um, I think when we say honesty at work and we're talking about it, maybe as part of a leadership breakout or as part of just a project kickoff, people tend to immediately think, well, are you calling me a liar? And that's not ex at all what we're meaning, but it's maybe we're not sharing an, enough information. And so what I'd like to do um, as we move forward is I want you to think about, if you haven't already, project scenarios. And those scenarios could be very PM-centric, like milestones or events, um, or uh, just stages along the way where information sharing is really challenged and it really needs to come, come to pass, all right? So if we can do that, It's, again, I'll just do this. I want to I be down there with you guys. So give me an example of the scenarios in the project where this can happen. And it, again, it doesn't have to be necessarily a milestone, but I just gave you that as an idea. The project is behind, and what? <laughs> okay. And in that role, are you a project manager or are you a key contributor or? Yeah, yeah. So has anyone been in that situation? Your, the project is off schedule and you have to share that. Where are some of the op uh, places where you need to share that? Executive readouts, Executive readouts steering team meetings, right? And depending upon that relationship, right, is dependent upon how resistant some people are to share that. So that, that's one example, I thank you very much. And that example just could be pressure, right? Um, it's bad news. 
Is that the way you were thinking of it, Vivian, or did you think of it a, in a different way? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and you said behind for a so schedule, so there's always pressure to complete on time. And the, what happens the, the more that you kind of hold that information? Right. First of all, you're stressed out, and the team kind of knows it anyway. But time is moving forward, and now it's getting harder and harder, right? So I think it's in that case, it's literally just one example is courage, courage to bring it up. And it's always best to bring the truth up earlier than later, right? There are a lot of good phrases about that. Okay, great one. I'm looking for something different. Yes, sir. I've had a situation where uh, someone in a project is the eternal optimist. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's like just two more things need to happen and we'll be back on schedule. But for those two things to happen, the stars need to align and galaxies need to shift. But they still think, you know, that this is, this is going to do it. So they keep kind of pushing that ball a little bit forward. Yeah. In that situation, uh, you guys are doing a good job of protecting the innocent, which we, we know you we would do, right? And uh, so um, was that, can you share what role that person had or have you, if it wasn't just one person, you know, what generally, where do you, what role is that? Well, it's, it's happened a couple of times, but I had a tech lead. He said a tech lead. So we were doing software development and uh, he did the design and, you know, we need to get a virtual environment up and a couple of other things up in order for it to, you know, to, to hit that milestone. But yeah. 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 So what was your... Where does the honesty and transparency come in here? Was it you having that conversation? I, had, I did. I had to like help him understand the difference between fantasy and reality. Yeah. Um, it was a little bit painful, but we yeah. got there. Do you mind the scenario? Yeah. So the scenario for those watching is this: uh, this person kind of took that that uh, persona of being overly optimistic. And in that situation, our contributor here in the room found that having that one-to-one -one conversation, which is exactly another opportunity where I appreciate you going, um, having that conversation just to share feedback with that individual, right? So uh, those aren't always easy. And so two places so far we've talked about here is just courage. Some people call it managerial courage. I don't like that word, but just courage to share, share the truth and share where we are, get that out on the table. And the second one here it was an opportunity to be honest and have a one-to-one. -one. And so these, are, these things aren't rocket science, but it's still hard to do when you think back to my initial description of all those pushes and pulling and time, and we're all trying to create our pieces of the puzzle to be not only fit the puzzle, but look good. So when that end product, that end puzzle is done, it's valuable to the business. Thank you very much. All right, let's keep going. This is, this is the meat I wanted to go to, and I know it's harder to hear in here, um, but uh, these are good examples. What else do we have? Unintended production outage due to human error. Unintended production outage due to human error. Sounds like you have a very specific memory of this, right? Yeah, yeah. So what was your honesty moment there, uh, or transparency, what did you have to do? Really, it wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, you're, when you're dealing with Medicare, when you're dealing with Medicare members, members, we had a situation where we actually deleted 80,000 members. Um, so the sooner you know that it happened, the sooner you can back it out and restore, but if you get someone that kind of hides it, and slowly kind of... It festers, right? So for the video, Give me just a moment, sorry about that. It's like public service announcement. Uh, this, this person's um, example was um, a production, I think I already said that, but I'll say it again, the production outage of 80,000 people were affected? Yeah, and so they were probably temporarily deleted, and then so that spawned probably other negative uh, things that 
um, the colleague of this person had to deliver that information to whom? Yes, to their senior leader. Do you know how that conversation went? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're looking like it wasn't pleasant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And to end the movie, everything's okay. All right. Good, good. Thank you for that. Yes. All right. Yes, there is. I think I heard another phrase that I wanted to hear is that I hear you say culture of fear. Okay, so culture of fear was raised that maybe that was the why or the root cause of the person not wanting to share the information in, in the beginning. And so I think it's not just, it could just be a culture of fear, but that could be in pockets in some organization or even just some pockets of the project team. It's so dynamic. Or it could just be fear that we have, right? And, it, and it, it's, you don't want to admit it sometimes uh, that we each may have a fear. But when you get in those situations, it's human nature. It is absolutely human nature. And it's okay, right? If any of us say that we have never been fearful in our lives, I don't care if it's falling four feet or taking a dive off, off a diving board, we're lying to ourselves. So for some reason, when we grow up and we get on the project, we uh, tend to be stoic and act like fear is not going to get us, but that's when it usually does. All right, these are great. Uh, so we had courage, we had fear, and we have a one-to-one -one conversation, which could introduce, it's another word, a one-to-one -one conversation could be based on, hey, I gotta have a one-to-one -one with this person. We got some conflict, right? In that situation, the conflict wasn't necessarily negative, but it was a conflicting kind of view of, that, of the project status. Same thing, need a one-to-one. -one. And I bet after that one-to-one, -one, no matter how you know, uncomfortable it may have felt, did things get better? Well, when you look at the reason behind his optimism, yeah. he wanted to do a good job. So can't fault him for right. that. It's just more along the lines of project risk that we needed to talk about. So yeah. that's kind of how that went. Yeah. Just yesterday, in my latest client, um, we spoke uh, the day before. My colleague and I were on the phone with a, a, a North American HR leader talking about change and how it was gonna affect people. And his view was, folks in production, it's gonna be fine. Next day, after we turn the flip the switch, no big change. The next day, we're talking to a project manager who we figured would have that point of view times two. His was all emotional that, oh, we gotta, we gotta to be in front of the message. We gotta take care of these people's emotion because they're gonna be very emotional when this large company's name change comes out. And it was so backwards then. They're on the same team, right? This is the same uh, spinoff team. And not only were their views backwards, it's not as we would have expected. We have an HR guy, we have a project manager, and they were different. So great opportunities, again, to never assume what people are thinking and just have those conversations. Anyone else have any more examples for us? I'm, I'm being cognizant. You give me a flash when it's time to keep going, all right? Because so, I won't have much more after this. Yes, yes, sir. So with respect to um, records you mentioned, uh, yeah. again, we're talking about backups on February the 24th. <laughs> uh, the, uh, what I was gonna say is that sometimes we come alongside customers to do projects and the human error happens on their side, where somebody who's in a key position, whether a director or manager, has done something incredibly wrong, and as consultants, we're trying to protect their reputation. Yes. So our honesty gets challenged because we want to protect the other customer who's spending money with them. Yes. It gets so complex, right? Right. That example is from a contractor consultant point of view, and there has been an error within the organization. We have to call it out as an external person, but we ha need to protect you know, the, the face, and we want to come across in a professional way, but we also have to deliver the truth. 
So that's a that's an extra layer of complexity there. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> when I used to work in the university system, um, one of the things that we discovered in our leadership um, classes that we took um, for personal development is the whole idea that everybody wants to be honest, but sometimes people don't feel comfortable um, sharing their opinions. Yes. So one of the things that helps is providing opportunities for people to understand what the real questions are gonna be before, they're set, before they sit in the room and give feedback. And then also understanding that just because somebody doesn't agree with your point of view doesn't mean that, 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 that you shouldn't hear it. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the most important thing is listening Making people feel heard makes them feel comfortable with being honest. Yeah, so I heard a couple of things there. You said that you all set expectations or made the questions available prior to this sit down or this group meeting, right? Um, even what you call the meeting helps to kind of diffuse the tension, right? And so that was, that's really good. That's creative. And I think a lot of times we want to do that and we just don't feel like we have the time. It's like, let's just get everybody together. We got to talk. And then people come in, they're not prepared, or maybe their expectations weren't even set that they were gonna to come to the table. Maybe they needed time to get the facts, and it's, right? Because sometimes I feel untruthful. I see some heads nodding. I feel untruthful maybe myself because I just didn't get all the facts, but I'm trying my best to answer the question today. So thank you for sharing that. Excellent, yes. I was just gonna say um, along the same lines, and also a cultural thing, you talked about a culture of fear. Not in my current organization, but in a previous organization. You got a friend, right? Yeah, yeah, I got a, yeah, a friend. <laughs> brought in uh, as a technical, in a technical leadership role to a team, and we had a product going live in about one month, right? Yes. And uh, the team, I asked the team how it was going. I said, well, we've, our testing isn't complete yet. And I was like, well, I'm guessing you told our stakeholders, like, dude, we can't tell them that part. And I was like, you have to tell them that. And so I'm like, well, I'm going to go to our product team and tell them, like, and so I went and told them, and you would have thought I opened the door to the boardroom and threw a grenade in and walked away and got coffee. Um, wow. And I said, our testing isn't complete. I have never been reamed out so much by a senior leader in my company as I was for, wow. for, telling, for telling that. It went on for multiple days, by the way, the, my butt chewing that I got for that particular bit of honesty. So, um, yeah, so I think it just sort of starts from the top, right? Yeah. If, you want to, if you're a senior leader, I think it's important to encourage, you know, yes, you may not be happy with the message, but we'd rather know the truth than have it go live untested for a How did you feel with all, while all the butt chewings were going on? I didn't feel great. Yeah. It discouraged me from being as honest, um, and I'm no longer with that organization. That's right. There, there we go. And, but I'm going to guess that deep down, you were, you were probably feeling just fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought I did yeah. the right thing, but yeah. no one likes to be in it. Yeah, right. You jeopardized our reputation. I took a hit because you had to go mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, but it's so much worse, I think, and I apologize about those those conversations. No, I don't apologize, but I'm sorry you had to go through that. So, but uh, it's so much worse though, holding it back, knowing that that you know that the risk is still there. All right, I'm going to move forward. These oh, we got a hand up, so I'm definitely honor that. One more, I think, probably the courage, but it is calling out that often in our projects accepting mediocrity to be a timeline to be a dollar sign to as opposed to really pushing to, to do the right thing yeah yeah that's a very uh, kind of covered under a blanket right it's like we're talking and we're moving it forward but every, a few people kind of know that eh, the quality is suffering right is that what you're talking about that in, 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 not only quality but you get a roadblock I'm not going to try to add more to that. Well put. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to move us forward. I'm going to show you just um, a couple that a few of us put together. Um, and I, I have, if anybody would like this, I've got, it's very editable. As you can see at the bottom, I've got some openings because the way we were going to facilitate this at the other place was a little different. But anyway, um, 
You can see the examples. I have three up there. A couple of them were close to what you guys shared. Uh, but the wavy paths are there because it's very unpredictable. You don't know when it's going to happen. You might think it's going to happen at the testing phase or the first phase gate or stage gate, if I said that right. Uh, but the little vertical lines I have, some are bolded, some are not. This is different milestones, right? Or different activities that happen in a project. So if you all would like this, I'm sure we're providing it, right? And we can make sure you get an editable copy. But it was just something that, that I felt from all the years, that's just the way it feels like in my head. And I think it could be something that you share in a kickoff, right? Right at the beginning or during the planning phase, just to get it, oh, go ahead, let's go ahead and get this out on the table. When these things happen, let's agree as, as a group or as a group of stakeholders, urging, same, sharing this with the steering team members. They got the same pressures with just extra zeros behind them, right? So this is um, how I see it in my head, and it's, it's very kind of asymmetrical, but wanted to share that. And finishing up, I thought we just spoke about this in projects, and it's not just projects, right? Initiatives, um, any kind of change activities that are going. It could be brief, it could be medium-sized, large, et cetera. But this, uh, when I was searching the web, this really hit me as about the changed workplace. No longer a changing workplace, it's already changed, right? Hybrid, whether you call it virtual, um, but I thought this statement was really powerful, is honesty or sharing of information is really challenged even more, just in day-to-day -day meetings behind the screen. And it's, again, it's not because someone's maybe intending to be dishonest, but they just have this wall of virtual to be kind of hidden behind or, be, or they're focused on other things and we're all guilty on it, right? So um, it's just something to be aware of keenly and I think that we as leaders, if, if we're truly applying leadership, that we address these things early. Um, it may feel a little, gosh, I gotta stop and have another meeting before a meeting, but call it what it is, you know, put it on the table. So I'm going to end with a couple of you all brought up trust and integrity. This is, this is a really helpful slide that uh, we at Centric have. Um, and it just, sometimes words like trust and integrity, they sound vague and they sound, oh, it's so human, it's over here. Or I only get that when I go to a leadership conference or training, et cetera, or I took my 360 feedback. But it's all the time. So you build trust through, uh, the best definition I ever saw is that you build trust through character and competency. These others matter as well, but I love that simplicity of just character, who you are, you show up, you follow up. And if I say I'm a change leader, I need to know what I'm doing, right? So, or if you're a technician or you're an engineer, you need to know your X's and O's but you do it with good character, right? So that's, again, it's not rocket science, but that's what builds trust. People go, they know what they're talking about and they proved it by following up with me and being honest. It, and once I found that definition, I only found it a year and a half ago in the efficiency program, you know, that we were working on. Um, and it just really allowed me to bring it up more in a better way than just say, hey, let's build trust. Let's Let's be transparent. Tie it to a real definition, you know. So, again, these are more examples, and I've bolded them, that of how your activities around this and your peers can happen every day. You'll have access to these slides. Um, and takeaways. Um, I, you guys brought this to the table, so thank you, first of all, for speaking up in a room where it's hard to hear. Um, but um, Doug, I'd turn it to you, do you as far as takeaways from this um, and having done this, um, done this program, what do you think? We've got a lot of good ideas that came from the group. First of all, thank you very much, AJ. <laughs> 
Second, um, I think all the opinions on honesty are extremely valuable, especially in the moment. This is a real-time problem that most of us have to solve. I think we forget about that from time to time, uh, and it's often hardest in real time. Take advantage of the models that you're going to get in these slides and study them. Spend a little bit of time with them. I, I know that um, you know some have more words, some have less words. I think the diagrams are useful, and I actually think they're useful with your teams. So liberally steal from AJ and Centric, and and if this stuff looks interesting to you, take advantage of Centric's capabilities, uh, or or chat with AJ to make sense of what you've seen here today. Any final comments from the group? We are right on time. You couldn't have, uh, you couldn't have timed that any better. That's really impressive. I'm gonna switch uh, topics here. I'm gonna switch the PowerPoints and we'll get Rick up in just about two minutes here. If you would like to get some more, please eat something. IT people never eat, they just drink gallons of coffee. Please grab some more coffee and a little bit more food while we get set up for Rick, thanks. All right, find your seats. We're gonna let Rick get started here. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick Mook. Okay, hey everybody. Uh, first off, thank you, Doug, for the invitation. Very kind of you. And thank you to Eric and Bellerman for hosting. Eric, wherever you are, appreciate it. Uh, and thanks to each of you. I'm excited to uh, get to work with you today. This is going to be fun. I'm Rick. Uh, so I'm an agile guy. Uh, what does that mean? I help teams and groups of teams solve complex problems. Uh, I've worked across, gosh, uh, healthcare, energy, IoT, hospitality. Uh, now finance, bunch of different industries, anywhere from one or three teams all the way up to 30 uh, at a time. Uh, and uh, I want to talk with you today a little bit about agility, which is a subject near and dear to my heart. It's a subject that many of you probably have visceral reactions to uh, in one way or another. It's been used and abused. Uh, in many different ways, sometimes for good and sometimes for evil. Uh, that a lot of the talk about agility that we hear these days is really about business value, right? We promise to deliver maximum value in minimum time. Uh, we have much better success rates than those boo waterfall projects, right? Uh, and, and that's all, you've heard that before probably if you've been around the block. Um, I, I wanna focus on something a little different. I want to focus on the connections between agility and its truest, corest form. <laughs> We're going to go all the way back to the manifesto here today. Uh, I want to focus on connections between that and humanity, broadly speaking. And my reason for doing this is I really think that this is one of those opportunities that's sitting out there waiting to happen. Uh, and you can probably see this if you've been on a team that works together really well. Those people were able to bring out their humanity with each other uh, in a way that's pretty special and motivating. It helps with retention, helps with delivery. Uh, in other words, the better humans we can be at work, uh, the better our projects will thrive. That's part of what I'm, I'm going for here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, those connections and, and give some quick tips on how to do that. So my basic thesis here is that uh, agility makes us, uh, enhances our humanity at work. That's another way to put it. Um, so, uh, to get started, uh, on your table you'll find some small slips of paper with some factors that are important and valuable in any project. Uh, there should be eight of them. And I'd like you to take a minute at your tables. Uh, just, uh, I'll time it. This is gonna be a five minute exercise. And for those of you joining virtually, don't worry, we're gonna show these up on the screen later. Uh, I want you to go ahead and try to figure out which of these are most important. Go ahead and have a conversation and try to star the one or three or however many things you think are really the most important. There is no one right answer. This is based on your own experience and those experiences will diverge. On your mark, get set, go. Everybody's at a place with this. It doesn't have to be a final place because there is no final place. But tables, raise your hand if, I don't know, documentation made it on your list of more important things. Hi, Holly. Okay, one table, poor documentation. All right, 
uh, get, go ahead and raise your hand if individuals and interactions was on your list. Holy cow, all right, we have a very near consensus on that one, great. Well, so the story goes that many moons ago, a group of middle-aged white guys uh, got together in a ski resort out west. Uh, this is literally true. And there they wrote the Agile Manifesto, which is the founding document of Agile. So when we speak about agility, we should really be talking about that. And it comes from a very particular perspective, right? A, a certain socioeconomic perspective. But there are some lessons to be learned from that document nonetheless. So uh, what we have here is the four Agile values. The Agile Manifesto, which you can still see on the original website. It has the worst pattern background ever and serif font. It hasn't changed a bit since 2001. What it says is that we, uh, we see value in all of these things, but we believe there is more value in the things on the left. So when you have a choice between individuals and interactions on the one hand and processes and tools on the other, guess where the more value is? It's in the individuals and interactions. If you have a choice between customer collaboration and contract negotiation, guess which one is more valuable? What's going to lead to the delivery of more value? Collaborating with the customer, actually working together to figure out what the most value is, as opposed to haggling or negotiating over a document. Same thing with working, pro which would you rather have? You know, a book about a car or an actual car? <laughs> right, this, this one is kind of self-evident. And lastly, which would you rather do? Uh, and this is what I call the lemming principle. Would you rather follow the plan or adapt to the change? Right? Uh, of course, we should adapt, we should change course rather than blindly follow a plan. That's a no-brainer. So again, these are not, this is not to say, please, that there is no value in the things on the right. All of these things are valuable. It's just to say that in the agile mindset, we favor the left side factors. Okay, we can group these a little bit, and here I'm gonna draw some connections to the previous presentation, right? So the first two, the, the top left quadrant, if you will, <laughs> the values of focusing on individuals and interactions and customer collaboration, you can see in there that the document points to a kind of mutual recognition, right? It's about, it's about connecting with others. It's about mutual regard. And in, that, in some way, it's about compassion, right? We're engaging with these people not to dominate. We're engaging with these people to collaborate, to work together, to understand what each other need and help meet those needs. It's very basic. And you can see on the two on the bottom left that here we have uh, the word empiricism comes up, right? This is the scientific enterprise. Uh, we're going to be flexible. We're going to grow. We're going to adapt. We're going to try and see. We're going to learn by doing. This is how we got to the moon on kerosene, right? Is by trying things. Uh, Werner von Braun, the famous rocket guy, right? Why, why was he so good at building rockets? And his answer was, I crashed more rockets than everybody else. That's how I got good at, at launching rockets, right? So we learn by doing. All right, I want to engage you in a little active exercise, but in order to do that, and then I'll bring out the next point, I promise, I'm gonna need three volunteers. One, two, this is your chance to be brave and famous. One more. Come on. Yes, three. All right, come on up. So these three people have one, one important job. You don't have to come up on stage. You can stay down there. And the job is as follows. In, on that table over there are two buckets. One of the buckets contains a whole bunch of blocks. Your job is to very quickly get all of those blocks. Each of them must touch the table everyone's hands and into the other bucket. Got it? So every single block must touch each of your hands, the table, and then go into the other bucket. On your mark, get set, go. doing great. 
Oh, somebody's helping. That's so nice. I can see Teresa thinking, this is the worst project charter ever. <laughs> Please, very good. Oh no, stay up, stay up, stay up. Anna, come back. All right, 43 seconds. I want you to have a quick conversation and think about how you do it differently the next time. Go ahead. Okay. So I like your idea of shifting it. Mm -hmm. so I think, what do you think? We put it down, everyone touch it real quick, and then you just shift it back. Do you have that, or whenever you're touching it, you just be putting it in the box. Yeah, since okay. you would be last. Okay. All right, they look ready. On your mark, get set, go. Stop. Okay, you reduced your time by 10 seconds. Give them a round of applause. Okay. Now I'm not gonna make them do it, but if they had to do it a third time, see, they love each other now. If they had to do it a third time, do you think they would go even faster? Yes, my record that I've observed is six seconds. One person poured the blocks through the other person's hands with their own in there as well and gravity did all the work, and they got all of them in in six seconds, right? That's the kind of innovation that we unleash with agility. There's my pitch. But notice what happened at the end. What happened at the end of the second exercise? Wonderful moment. What did they do? They gave high fives, right? So they, they I mean, this is, folks, this is hardwired into us. This is what humans do. We build teams. Right? This is how we survive. This is how we, in we invented agriculture, right? We invented cities. This is how we relate to each other fundamentally. Agility draws this out. A great way to do this is with the virtuous cycle of empiricism, the, what we might also call the three pillars of scrum, transparency, inspection, and adaptation. First, you have to observe what's there, which means you have to be willing to expose it. Here we come back to honesty, right? You have to be willing to see what's actually happening. Then you have to dive into it a little bit and get critical. You have to move beyond blame and think about like, what's the root cause here, right? Why would someone think this was the best way to go? What conditions existed to make that seem like a good idea? It's a really powerful question, right? And then lastly, we adapt. We're willing to change. We're willing to try new things. You can also see this inherent mutual regard in what's often called the Agile Prime Directive. For those of you Trekkies, right, the Prime Directive is that, you know, the folks on the Enterprise aren't allowed to interfere with the developing civilizations, right? Uh, here in, in the world of Agile, it means we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could, given what was the case, right? Nobody's going to work in the morning trying to do a bad job. <laughs> Right? So we grant each other, again, compassion, mutual regard, the best of humanity. We try to rise to that level of understanding every day in the Agile world. Okay, so if you take a minute and think here, as I think we've maybe done, for maybe the first time today for each of you, about what makes humans great, <laughs> right? Those are likely traits that one has an opportunity to cultivate in an Agile context. That's my message today. Mutual regard and compassion, accepting our differences and our faults, so that what? So that we can transcend them. 
so that the team can adapt. If one of these team members had one arm, they would still, the team would find a way, right? If all we have is kerosene and a rocket, the team will find a way, <laughs> right? Learning, experimentation, and empiricism. Uh, there's this, for those of you who do a lot of, anyone use Kanban with their teams? Kanban Agile Framework? Okay, a few people do. There's this spooky moment, if you're doing it really well, there's this spooky moment where the, the statistics diverge. Individual productivity at the issue level drops. In other words, Bob and Jane are each doing fewer tickets, but the throughput of the group increases. How do you actually get more done with a team when the individuals are doing less, right? It's spooky, it's counterintuitive, but that's exactly what happens, and Little's Law proves it. <laughs> it's really cool, right? So, uh, you know, that, that learning, that empiricism, that experimentation, it unleashes the group. Does it lead to heroes and heroic individuals? No, but it leads to a healthier group. It leads to a healthier society and it allows us to transcend our limitations as, as humans. So, how might one proceed on this journey? If you're wondering, well, this sounds great, but how do I get going with it? Um, there are a number of options you could choose, and they're all over the place. Uh, one is, if we were simply to migrate back a slide, choose the things on the left over the things on the right. <laughs> That's called having an agile mindset, uh, and it works it will eventually lead to transformations in your organization and it will help others do the same. Get closer to customers. Actually meet a customer, actually collaborate with them. Bring them into your team. Have them ride along for a week and get them what they really want. That's another, that's another good option. Deliver more frequently. Uh, many of you are probably delivering an actual thing on the scale of six months. Uh, one of the places I worked, we managed to drop that to three weeks. And the results were dramatic. The customers had something they could actually touch and see and feel in three weeks. Now, did we stop working on it? No. No, we had, we had to have trust with them that we would stick with it, that we would continue. Um, but that trust can be built. And lastly, I would encourage you all as leaders, this goes back to something that AJ shared earlier, uh, I would encourage you all as leaders to move away from control and towards support. Move away from control and towards support. So you engage the group, you look at metrics, you look at progress and performance, not to tell the team what to do. I did not tell them how to make those blocks go into the box faster, right? You don't tell people what to do. You offer support, you offer an opportunity to try again, you offer whatever training is needed. You say, how can I help you be the best team you can be? What would your next step be, team? How would you like me to help you do that? What a fantastic way to lead, right? Servant leadership. And what that does is it cultivates group ownership, right? Because it's now the team that's accountable. It's the team that owns the things. That's all good stuff. So, all right. Um, in the end, uh, I, I should add that these are only words, so they can be used, as we've said, for good or evil. <laughs> uh, and many of you have been in a context where they've been used for evil, uh, probably, and have some scar tissue related to that. So I just encourage you to give agility a second look, you know? Yeah. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. you kind of offhandedly mentioned servant leadership and you want to live next thing. So I'm a big fan of that leadership style. Uh, do you have any direct experience with that yourself or? Servant leadership. Oh yeah, yeah. Do I have any experience with servant leadership? Uh, well, I can only hope that in some small way I've had some experience doing it. Uh, I know I've had some experience receiving servant leadership from others, absolutely. Uh, I think that's, that's a big part of what makes these teams tick. Um, and it can come from anywhere. <laughs> it can come from anybody on the team, it can, but it's especially powerful, I think, when it comes from a senior leader in the organization. Yeah. Is that kind of where you were going? Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Um, I just want to remind you of the upcoming events, April 13th. Whoops. April 13th on, pardon me. April 13th, happy hour against the Grain Brewery. This is casual, oh my goodness. All right, I quit. Um, this is a casual event, um, the happy hour. We're thinking in the three to five o'clock range at Against the Grain, and that's downtown, right? Ballpark area, okay, great. Uh, no presentation. This is all about getting a network together and having a chat and maybe a little bit of beer and a little bit of food. So please attend that. And then May 9th for the upcoming event that's gonna feature Elias Oxendine and another guest speaker here in town. If you have any questions, please contact me. I will be reaching out to you here in the next couple of weeks just to get your feedback. I am so grateful to get the chance to meet each and every one of you. And Eric, thanks again for helping us scramble for a new venue for this one time. We will be back at Yum Brands uh, for the May event and for the August and November event. So we'll see you there, uh, not too far away from here, fortunately. Thank you, have a great day.